You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 318 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I am Stephen Seagraves, joined by Seth Miller, Fosma Mood, and today, special guest from Air Canada, uh, Mr. Mark Nasser, uh, Vice President of Loyalty and E-Commerce, and uh, Scott O'Leary, the Managing Director of Loyalty Pl- uh, Planning and Development. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks for so having us. It's good to have you guys. From the Great White North. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not so snowy white quite yet, but <laughs> it's coming. Um, it's coming. Glorious bleeding. Beware the Ides of November. <laughs> I, th- I think we're like we, I think 200 we actually- miles away from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, really, the reason we wanted to have you guys, we invited y'all on, was to talk about the new Aeroplan program. And uh, I think I think I'm going to let Foz kind of take the lead on this because I think he first has some reminiscing he wants to do with you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear about the bear that got hit in Alaska? Yes, yes. Oh my God, Yakutat. Uh, we've taken that flight together. I know. I was like, I, I can only imagine what that must have been like. Well, we're stuck here for an indefinite amount of time. I saw, I saw that story, and I was like, How does a bear get on the runway? And then I'm thinking, Oh, this is Alaska. That There's no yeah. fences. <laughs> when, I, yeah. when I saw that the bear with the mayor. <laughs> you think he knows the guy that. who owns the rental car place? <laughs> What were you going to say, Mark? When I saw the headline in my newsfeed this morning, and then I saw that there were pictures, I was really afraid of what those pictures were. Oh. Um, I, I was really afraid. But uh, there, there was a photo of the bear, like, dead on the runway, wasn't there? There was, but it wasn't. Luckily, it, I didn't see that. It yeah. doesn't look like it got ingested into the engine. Yeah. So that was a good part of that. Man. Small victories. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I guess first question about Aeroplan is, you know, how many mileage runs does it take to build a new loyalty program? Um, you know, I, I know that the media briefing, uh, some of the concepts were developed while you guys were out traveling. So Scott, let's start with you. How many mileage runs does it take? Uh, let's see. Uh, ask us about a year from now. We're still doing it. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where are your mileage running to right now? <laughs> Uh, let's see. I think the last one that we did was, uh, was Vancouver. We're kind of keeping it domestic for the moment, but, uh, yeah, uh, talks are already, uh, underway for something that, that, you know, goes to our normal, you know, trying to go around the world in the weekend. But boy, I, I'd say uh, up to this point, Mark, what is it about a, a dozen, uh, up to this point that I think would encapsulate this? I mean, sure, there's that answer, but here's another. How many mileage runs does it take to design a loyalty program? Well, uh, it depends who you're flying, because if you're doing it on WestJet, it will take five to seven times the amount of flights to get the same amount of value. Um, and, and we did include our domestic competitor for uh, for uh, 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 a run uh, on one of the uh, on one of the MRs. So, yeah. Well played. Well played. <laughs> In all seriousness, you guys know that some of the most creative ideas come uh, when you step back from your daily grind. Uh, and it just so happens that in our case, it's usually while wearing airline pajamas, you know, holding on to a glass of champagne. Yeah. Yeah, but we also, you know, we can't understate the importance of the hotel interactions and the bank interactions and the other things that we have, even in the planning process and the travel process for the mileage runs, right? Because like, I'll give you an example on, 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 on one of the you know, ones that occurred. Um, we had, uh, we did a last minute reroute when we landed in Singapore, we were supposed to go through Vietnam and then up and over. And that reroute caused to uh, have to rebook some tickets that were directly redeemed using points from an American uh, proprietary bank program, right? Not transferred, but directly redeemed. And just the process of actually calling in, figuring out who to call, what would be allowed to be done with the ticket, et cetera, taught us something, hmm. taught us something about how to handle changes and day of departure stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's the services and the experiences on the run. There's the calling and the planning and the booking. Um, there are the hotels and even in some cases, some retail you know experiences that happen uh you know when we're in the middle of the course there that's right i mean no one of these is complete without mark somewhere along the way calling an audible uh and uh completely <laughs> pivoting for the second half uh, of the journey i mean uh, it's forces you to try something new <laughs> i think I, I think seth had a follow-up question i do have a follow-up so I, this was i mean i threw this joke this question out as a joke but i mean i do get the idea of you know, getting away from the desk, getting and you know, I would have considered it, you know, delusional jet lag, not just a glass of champagne. But either way, the, the, the creativity is definitely different. So I understand that. Um, does the mileage run still exist 
at this point and under the new Aero Plan program? Is this something, right? Like you've, you've changed a lot of the way earning happens, the, the structure for points for elite status, all of those things. Does the mileage run as we once knew it still exist? Uh, you, you want to go ahead or you want me to? Uh, yeah, short answer. Sure it does, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of show are you running, Seth? <laughs> I feel like enhance is the next word coming out of his mouth. <laughs> um, maybe I'll give a crack at it. Um, so I think that um, the, the mileage run for the purposes of earning redeemable miles is more or less done. Um, that's not to say that, you know, carrier choice or routing choice or branded fare choice isn't influenced. You know, I would call though a mileage run for the purposes of redeeming miles, more of a modifier on a planning, on a plan trip than an actual primary purpose for a trip. And quite frankly, you know, environmental and other considerations altogether, that probably makes a good deal of sense at this point. Um, uh, you know, the on the ground earning opportunities from the programs have become so much richer, uh, between the, obviously the financial products, the, the co-brand credit cards. And, and the like, but also other partnerships. And you'll see us make a bunch of exciting announcements in the next couple of months to that end. Um, you know, so you look at all of that in the totality of the to earn structures, the, al- the alternative ways of earning miles, the more competitive on the ground environment. And there's just better ways to do it than, you know, uh, there was 10 years ago and 20 years ago, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the earn side, uh, the earn side, obviously, you know, as Mark points out, is still, you know, it's optimizable. Uh, it's just you're earning in, in, in many respects different ways than you might have 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, but then there's also optimizing on the redemption side. Uh, it's, you know, sometimes the sequence, uh, you know, uh, that you go about planning a trip that can lead to a completely different outcome. And uh, I mean, that, that kind of touches on some of the features of the program, the new program, right, with stopovers and, you know, open jaws and things that weren't particularly possible with the previous program with a small upcharge for that. Um, do you, is that kind of what you're alluding to, Scott? Uh, for sure. For yeah. sure. Uh, what we what we wanted in the design of this program is to have an answer for everything uh, and one that came across as very fair and, and reasonable. Uh, you know, you know, especially uh, on a on a longer distance trip when folks are are planning to go far, uh, it's very intuitive to want to make a stop here uh, along the way to break up your trip uh, to add points of interest. Uh, and uh, you know, clearly, we want that answer to be yes. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of a, a very reasonable uh, pricing result, and that so that was definitely an inspiration uh, of our design. So, you know, one of the questions that we were wondering about is the program's just gone live a little over a week ago. What surprises have you found during the relaunch? Um, so maybe I'll take the first crack at that. Um, you know, in, in, in all seriousness, we've, first of all, our team has the badges and scars of a number of major travel IT launches and cutovers in the last, you know, 20 years. Um, and particularly in the loyalty space, uh, a number of them seem to have misfired a little in the last, you know, little bit as well. And so when we began this process and all the planning a couple of years ago, we, we, we said something just very, very simple. We promised a smooth transition to the new program, um, you know, back in 2017. And then, you know, or we promised a smooth transition to the redesign program after the aeroplan acquisition. Smooth, right? Smooth. Um, so how did we design smooth? You get to keep your number. Um, you get to keep your login credentials, et cetera. Um, miles come over on a one-to-one basis, miles to points, uh, and all certificates and features and um, profile information, et cetera, migrate also over without losing anything. Um, you can call the call center and you can get through with a reasonable hold time or no hold time. Um, and, uh, you know, you can navigate the digital channels, right? That to us was, hey, not um, something spectacular or over delivering, but that just seems like a smooth, reasonable expectation for members. And um, the cutover itself ended up being much more difficult than we had imagined. Um, we had done three full dress rehearsals in the lead up to it, but we had a number of what we would characterize as black swan events. Um, you know, that, you know, even our CIO who has dozens of cutovers from oil and gas to airlines and in between under her belt um, had never seen before. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were ready to actually call off the cutover and delay it um, four different times during the process because of the bar that we had set of not fixing forward, but rather landing in a solid place for that smooth transition right from the get-go. You know, the first impression was really going to matter to us with Aeroplan. 
Um, and ultimately, uh, we were able to do that. So certainly the cutover process uh, produced some surprises for us, um, even though ultimately the cutover was super smooth. We actually only have really one error we found, which is some AQDs didn't come over, but it was a very limited boutique use case and we had fixed it by the end of the week. Um, our contact centers right now for a non-elite member, you know, we're picking up the phones on average in about 12 to 15 minutes. Um, you know, and for elites, it's under a minute, if any, whole time, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, but but there were some big surprises uh, with the cutover weekend itself. I'll, I'll give you just for shits and giggles. I'll give you the, the, the biggest one. At one point, phone number formats uh, had stopped us from the cutover because there was a corruption, not a corruption, but different um, ways of formatting phone numbers from really legacy accounts, you know, versus modern accounts that have been created under a new profile system. And for whatever reason, that was causing a whole bunch of downline failures. Like your dashboard didn't load on the website. Uh, <laughs> the agents couldn't pull up the accounts in their applications, et cetera. And like you're in the middle of a cutover and you're going over your scripts and you're looking at things. And you're like, oh my God, we can't load accounts. This is a sea of phone numbers, not a very serious issue. Not being able to load accounts Serious issue, but ultimately the team was able to work through uh, all of those things and come out on the other side there. <laughs> wow. Thought, uh, Seth, you know about escaping characters, right? I, I do know about escape characters. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and I were just troubleshooting that uh, on something else for a tech staff I'm building over the weekend or last week at some point. So, uh, yeah, now, f- phone number formats are very complicated. It's There's a specific plan, but it's, it, gets, it gets ugly. Yeah, yeah. So now, did this take three years to build or was it a longer process? Because you mentioned 2017. Yeah, so um, maybe Scott talks about that too. Um, you know, what what we did uh, was we did a ton of research and then out of the research, we did product development, but the research and the product development overlapped. And then out of the product development, we designed experiences and did prototyping, but the product development and the prototyping overlapped. And so essentially every inch of the program, the user experience, the policies, all of that stuff had gone through agents and customers in a variety of different forms um, prior to launching. And so, yeah, we really did you. And then, of course, building. Right. And that, that was just that was just deciding what we wanted to do uh, and validating it. Then we actually had to build it and we had to you know push some vendors further than they've ever been pushed before. You can take a look at our award search depth and that's probably the best example of it. Um, and yeah, that took uh, that took three and a half years. Hmm. Wow. Crazy. Um, I mean, so what you're saying of... is award programs are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I just, I got fly a little, you give me some points and then I redeem it for first class. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? That's right. We just run it on an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. an access database might be more, you know, with your history. Um, well, that's that's idea. I was going to say that same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like major front end websites that you used to manage had access databases driving parts of their functionality. It's completely reasonable. <laughs> uh, and I, so I have a follow up question about kind of it taking three years to develop. I mean, now, now that we're in the midst of COVID, right? That was something you couldn't have foreseen three years ago. Did it give you any hesitation announcing and releasing and launching a new program during a pandemic? Who, me? Sure. <laughs> I'm still wondering if access is the A in AWS, so maybe somebody can <laughs> clarify that. <for> you. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, yeah, you know, I'd be lying. Uh, we'd be lying if we said it wasn't uh, a, a consideration. Um, and, you know, at the end of it, uh, you know, it's there's just so many good things uh, uh, that you know, uh, that, that stand to be, um, you know, that we just wouldn't want to delay, uh, any further, uh, there, yeah, you know, we actually have a, a very engaged member base, uh, right now spend on our credit cards is, you know, uh, year over years, uh, you know, certainly down, but it's not nearly as, as, you know, far down, uh, as, as, you know, the airline side of the business as, as is the case with most other airlines. And so there are a lot of benefits to, you know, to pressing on and, and still launching against your, your original timeline. We did, did take, uh, however, uh, this as an opportunity to, you know, to to perhaps delay our launch uh, by a few months. You know, really going back to Mark's original point of, um, uh, you know, against the backdrop of the pandemic, does it really make that much of a, a difference commercially if we launched in November as opposed to our original target of August? 
Uh, and the answer was no. Uh, but it was all with it was really more centered around, you know, not necessarily a, a belief that the pandemic would be solved just a few months later, more so around what uh, wouldn't it be great if we actually gave ourselves an extra three to three and a half months uh, worth of testing and burn in, especially like in the uh, in the contact center and uh, with our frontline folks. Uh, and so we definitely took that opportunity. But beyond that, no, uh, they, you know, it's still every bit as relevant to, to launch a winning the loyalty program right now as it ever would be. Yeah, you, you mentioned the credit card uh, aspect of the program there and the significant, you know, balances you're seeing growing from that. And I've looked at some of the SEC filings for the U.S. carriers, the big four, and seen huge imbalance in terms of sort of the earn versus burn numbers. You guys had a 50% off redemption program, I know, a couple months ago. I hope that worked for you, but I can't imagine. You, know, you still are you're still burning through our points. So you're, you're getting into this weird imbalance um, in how the program's sort of uh, playing out right now. And you talk about the economics of launching the program. Does that skew things? Are you in, I don't want to say in trouble, but are you in trouble here? Be- because all of a sudden the points are, you know, you, you were changing all the accounting anyways. And now the points are worth a completely different amount than you thought they'd be, are being used in different rates than you thought they would. And you got, you know, weird legacy debt or something coming out of this. Is that going to change things down the line? Yeah. So, um, You know, one thing that's important to mention is a bunch of brands restricted uh, certain redemptions based on um, avoiding cash outflow. Um, And we did not do that. I mean, we are in a very, you know, the industry is in a very serious situation, right? Especially in Canada, we haven't had the billions and billions of dollars of, uh, you know, bailout aid, let alone loan dollars, you know, that um, some other countries have have provided their carriers. But we decided not to restrict, um, you know, non-air redemption. And so we've actually had quite a lot of growth in, um, you know, non-air redemption. We've also had non-air travel, like car and hotel, has fallen by much lower levels um, than air redemptions have as people, you know, have done, um, you know, summer vacations and things of that nature, Thanksgiving closer to home. Um, A lot of car car rental actually very interesting, but hotel as well. Um, So, yeah, our liability has grown and our earn burden ratios are off, but they're not off by as much as, you know, uh, I think some of our competitors um, might be off or what I would imagine. I don't don't, don't, haven't seen all the data. Um, and you know, as it relates to getting into next year and does this mess things up? No, no, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really mess anything up. I mean, there's certain, you know, we've suspended, um, uh, expiration because of COVID and we've made other changes. So to a certain extent, it's like time is frozen, not quite, but you know, if you, if you take that kind of for what it is, um, and you know, we're hopeful that things will unfreeze at some point here and that, um, you know, I'm sure some patterns and behaviors will change, but I don't think it will actually cause us to manage the program markedly differently from how it otherwise. And in fact, the new redemption model sets us up much better to have ebbs and flows in liability because now every seat is available and every seat on Air Canada is combinable, even with partner awards. Um, and so if you have higher demand or lower demand um, and you know more points out there after seats or less points there after seats, the program just naturally adjusts kind of to um, that ebb and flow. Are you saying that the point value is driven then by demand as much as the fare? If that no, makes sense, right? just that if there are if there are more points in the market, um, sorry, excuse me, if if if, if um, just that uh, th- there will be enough product to satisfy demand, no matter uh, how little or how much demand there is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Seth, did you have you had another question? Uh, sure, I'll go again. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I like talking. Uh, one of the interesting things, you know, when we sat in on the briefing, uh, what a couple months ago now it seems like, um, going through it, you guys spent a lot of time focused on how the program extends to families um, and how it's not just about the one person with elite status specifically. It's not just the one person who's earned elite status um, and then occasionally gets to share little bits of that along the way. Like if you're on the same PNR, you got you know the bag allowance or whatever. But you guys went further uh, in designing this. Is how is how important is that to the overall what you believe will be the overall success of the program? Um, and is that something that you think is very Canadian, or you know, could we expect to see that growing elsewhere in the world? Definitely, don't think it's just a, a Canadian thing. Um, uh, so, I, I think both of us will admit uh, that maybe we were surprised at how uh, how high the notion of of sharing, uh, just you know, sharing amongst family, sharing amongst uh, loved ones and, and friends how important that was when you kind of force rank all the potential attributes of a, of a loyalty program. 
But when you, uh, you know, when you double click on the insights, it actually makes more and more sense. And, you know, those insights, I think, uh, you know, are, you know, are definitely applicable in just about any other geography of the world. You know, quite simply, it's an innate desire to share what you have. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a big point of friction in loyalty programs today, especially for those that are maybe less uh, less tuned in. There's just an assumption uh, almost that I should be able to transfer my points or share my points uh, easily amongst uh, family members. Uh, folks in general are very disappointed to learn that, that that potential doesn't exist or at least not without a large charge uh, attached to it. And so uh, that is a very basic, uh, very basic desire. But then as you think about sharing benefits, uh, it's it's maybe slightly different. In that, uh, that became particularly important from our elite members. And uh, again, the reasoning made a lot of sense. Uh, the more and more I spend away from home, uh, the more and more important it is uh, that I can, uh, you know, show the rest of my family and loved ones value for all, call, you know, for you know, for all this time I've otherwise spent away from home. You know, it's really a way to address uh, maybe the latent guilt uh, that maybe some might feel for for spending so much time away from home. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when you think about it, the uh, the elite member. Uh, when traveling on his own or her own, maybe cares less about that occasional upgrade uh, or or that great thing that happened. Uh, but when they're traveling with family, uh, it's you know they they want nothing more than for the red carpet to be rolled out and for them to kind of be seen as uh, you know the, the special treatment as a direct result of all this time that they've spent uh, away from home. And that also goes on to cases where a friend or loved one might be traveling without the actual member and your ability to actually make that experience special for them uh, had very high emotional stakes to it. And so that also was a big consideration. You know, maybe the third thing uh, to, to maybe point out is when you think about you know, the, the, broad, uh, uh, the, the broad theme of enabling the family dynamic, this also has to do with uh, the power of a referral network. Uh, you know, for, for many folks, the credit cards that we use, the, the travel choices that we make uh, are the direct result of recommendations from friends or family members. And so, uh, you know, we, we thought anything that we could do to, to really build on that dynamic uh, just stands to service very well in that regard as well. You know, and it's, it's really interesting because this was an area, you know, we always get the question, well, did the pandemic change your plans? Are your plans still relevant because of the pandemic? This was an area that was very much the opposite. The pandemic has, or, or the, the consequence of the pandemic in some ways have actually made this element of the design much more important. Mm. Uh, a lot of airlines have been clear, most airlines in the world, that they view the first sources of traffic to come back are visiting friends and relatives and family and leisure travel, right? And that business travel and corporate travel will probably lag. Um, and so if you think about where the battleground is, um, from a demand perspective, as more and more people start traveling over the next you know, year or so, two years, it's going to be disproportionately on family, friends, that kind of thing. And it just so happens Air Canada now has a relevant uh, a, a program built for families, made for families, um, you know, made for friends and buddies um, that's just available um, exactly when, you know, kind of those demand patterns are changing. <laughs> so you, well, you planned it that way then is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <laughs> It makes it almost makes me wish I had signed up for Aeroplan, you know, back when I was doing Montreal every week. <laughs> uh, Never too late. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Foss, do you want to take the next one? Sure. So um, you have. Uh, yep. Excuse me. So when you built this program, you know, there was a you get to build it from scratch. What were some of the things that excited you, and what are the, some of the things that were daunting as you went into this rebooting? You know, not just rebooting something that existed, but coming up with something whole, all new. Sure. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, uh, everything was exciting. Um, I mean, it was kind of Dickensian, right? Like it was the best of times, the worst of times, you know, it was the most exciting of times. It was the most petrifying of times. Um, uh, what, what was, what was exciting is as we looked at kind of each individual element of the program, thinking through all the things we could do, what was daunting was looking at it in totality and thinking of all the things that had to be thought through and done, um, collectively. And remember, at one point, it was a brand new loyalty program with no safety net, right? With no existing base or systems to start out with. Um, and, you know, it, and, and, but yet all the expectations from users and members that have been engaged in the program for so long, right? Um, and then when the Aeroplan acquisition happened, it became this, you know, are we going to roll over any of the legacy stuff or are we really going to be end-to-end new stuff and a lot of pressure to, you know, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it from a program perspective, maybe, but certainly from a systems perspective, everything needed changing and renovating. 
Um, you know, so maybe that's kind of high level themes. I'll, I'll, I'll speak about one area, though, in particular that was daunting, the air redemption design, because just fundamentally what members want at odds, um, people want predictable pricing, um, you know, fixed charts, published charts, things of that nature. People want access to as much inventory as possible. Uh, people want, as you know, members want as much uh, optionality and flexibility in terms of changes or combinability or routing rules or stopovers, right? Um, and um, you know, at 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 any reasonable economic you know reality, some of those things just conflict. And you also have the reality that different members have different priorities. Members that you care about equally, cohorts of members you care about equally, you know, high revenue corporate travelers versus, you know, three times a year leisure travelers versus like, you know, they have different priorities for the program and different patterns. And so it was a square peg round hole the whole time. How do we, number one, find the right trade-offs between those different member desires? And number two, how do we ensure that, um, you know, it's not a zero-sum game. We're investing more than before, so the pie is bigger. But nevertheless, there still are slices or allocations of the pie, even though it's a bigger pie. How do we keep some, you know, uh, justifiable balance and fairness, you know, within within the pie, Right. Um, and it was incredibly daunting. And, and to this day, like I am, I am extremely confident and proud of the decisions that the team made of how we were able to advance the state of the relationship of revenue management, especially what I'm used to and seen in the past as not having been as tight of, a, of an understanding between loyalty and departments like RM. So I'm very proud and happy of where we landed. But even in the first week, you know, um, I, there are certain uh, we, we try not to take it personally, of course, because it's not. But there are certain blog posts highlighting all the things that, you know, they don't like, um, you know, but missing all of the great new areas of value that people do like. And I can tell you from the first week of redemptions, without a doubt, empirically, members are getting a better deal in Air Canada than they were before in the old program, period, plain, end of story. Um, so the program is doing what it was designed to do, more options, um, more flexibility, more partners, uh, certainly for uh, partner redemptions, uh, industry leading trans transparency at a time where transparency and charts are being removed or cutting against the grain. But for Air Canada, anything goes effectively in terms of inventory and routing options, but it's dynamically priced. The program is doing what it's supposed to do, which is deliver more value in the aggregate, which is remove those expensive paid in cash surcharges that nobody likes, um, you know, which is to offer more, more, more options on searches, et cetera, et cetera. And it's doing so at good values and trade-offs. But that doesn't mean that in every single use case or every single, you know, OD pair on every single date, um, you know, that everybody's going to be happy. And uh, so it was daunting thinking through that. And it continues to be daunting now, despite the fact that we can see the results or what we want, that there will be examples and there will be commentary and there will be critiques, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, aren't, aren't necessarily what we want them to be. When, when it comes to some of the changes you guys made, I mean, getting rid of the YQ, the fuel surcharge, airline surcharge, whatever you want to call it, uh, was a big shift uh, in the program. That was one of the sort of easy negatives of the old version of the program. Um, you know, in your sort of pros and cons and different levels of what people cared about, how how significant was that relative to some of the other stuff that changed? I mean, for me, it's like 100 and then everything else is much lower. But where does it fit for you guys? Uh, I think it was uh, definitely one of the top pain points. Uh, if, if, it were, if it wasn't the top one, it would have definitely sat in the in the top three uh, for sure. You know, the idea of of redeeming an award and still having to take out your wallet and, and spend potentially hundreds of dollars just doesn't doesn't compute for most folks. Uh, and you know, I, I, it kind of touches on a on on a broader theme. Uh, you know, we uh, you know empirically see stronger engagement from our members when they come, uh, you know, after they've made a redemption. Uh, and the more favorable the redemption, the more favorable their post-redemption activity is. And so uh, we put a, you, you know, just as we as we looked at the value proposition of the, of the program, we actually put more focus on redemption value uh, than in many respects versus earn value. Because uh, if you had a dollar to invest, you'd invest in trying to create more moments of redemption uh, and and a super frictionless uh, redemption experience at a at a very fair uh, at a very fair value point. Um, uh, because again, coming out of that, the the cycle of behaviors is, is super positive. Yeah, would you though? Because most it seems to me that most don't. Most programs don't. Most programs are just solely focused, or not solely, but much more heavily focused on the earn side than the burn side. And it's frustrating for me as someone who actually does try to use points more often than not. Um, 
you know, yeah, I, the, the, the reason why we, well, it's, it's always a balance, right? So we're not saying that, obviously, we're not saying that earn, it, it, you know, is, is, is irrelevant or not a big factor. But um, this goes to uh, customer acquisition versus customer retention. Um, and from our analysis, um, uh, being focused on rewards is really good for retention. Uh, being focused on initial earn, you know, things like that, good for acquisition. It's better and um, cheaper and, um, you know, we think ultimately healthier to keep members um, that you've had because it takes a lot to get a member and to build up their knowledge and comfort with the program to attach with behaviors like partners or credit cards or things of that nature. Um, so, you know, Aeroplan's problem, one of Aeroplan's problems wasn't brand recognition or awareness, certainly in Canada, or the fact that, you know, it had a huge database. The problem was the amount of people that were once engaged with Aeroplan that it stopped engaging with Aeroplan. You have, you know, pretty much, you know, every, uh, middle class, you know, most middle class and every, you know, uh, Canadian adult above that, that has a line in the Aeroplan database, but only a portion of them are actually engaging with the program. And so retention and re-engagement um, were huge um, considerations for us. Yeah, it makes sense. So one question that I have, Mark, you mentioned you know better alignment with revenue management. Does this mean we'll see more long-haul inventory open up? Because historically, Canada hasn't been very generous with that. Yeah, so um, you know we, we don't really speak in terms of inventory anymore because of uh, the, the way it works. It's you know really kind of lower prices versus higher prices, and I think that's what you mean. Um, and yeah, the answer is absolutely. In fact, uh, if you look at kind of the initial reviews of the program, uh, I think uh, most observers are uh, tickled pink uh, at the um, amount of long haul inventory that's or the sorry the amount of long haul you know good deals that are there um, in both economy and business class. Um, and especially when you bake in that uh, the um, carrier surcharges mm -hmm. were disproportionately high on the long haul flights. It's, you know, even better value. In fact, actually, I think that we still have a bunch of optimization to do to make sure we're balancing um, long haul and short haul, you know, mid haul bread and butter type redemptions, um, you know, but we certainly want to do two things. Uh, we have this amazing international network that we want um, folks to experience. And also, um, there was some perverse incentives in the design of the old program to really push people away from Air Canada to our partners. Now, we have no problem with uh, members redeeming on partners. We're not looking to make that hard, but we do want to make it easier and better on Air Canada so that we're not, you know, it's one thing to pull a partner away, but it's another thing to push a member towards a partner. And we're not looking to do that anymore. We want better gravitational pull of Air Canada redemptions, particularly in the long haul. Hmm. So, interesting. I mean, go ahead, Fuzz. I just was saying awesome. Yeah, because I, I was like looking, I mean, Air Canada has non-alliance partners like Azul, Etihad, Cathay Pacific, Gold. These are these are carriers that, you know, you you couldn't you couldn't necessarily wrap into a reward previously with a Star Alliance carrier on that same reward. But now you can. So you do have the incentive to take Air Canada maybe on that long initial long haul segment and then connect to one of these carriers, which to me is, is a huge benefit. And was that something you focused on when designing the program? You're just trying to get people to where they need to go to connect to these carriers or, or how did you look at that? Uh, it was a it, it was absolutely an intentional uh, focus of ours. You know, for every single one of these partners uh, that we have, and every one that we add on from here, it has a direct effect on the number of availability results uh, and, and reward, you know, positive reward results we can we can play back uh, to our members. Uh, just the, the the connectivity multipliers uh, in, in particular in certain regions of the world are are, are phenomenal. Mm, yeah, yeah, and. and um, you know, I, I'd, uh, I'd add to that. We're, we're really proud of the product that we have. Obviously, COVID has, has changed things, but we're really proud of the product we have. So I think some Western carriers might find it a little bit difficult from a product perspective to convince uh, members to want to redeem on their metal. But the investments we've made, particularly on the premium side, the signature suites, the, you know, we were the first in North America of pods, uh, I think 15 years ago. And, you know, we were the first to have a completely standardized, you know, modern reverse herringbone setup, et cetera, et cetera. We're really proud of the product. Um, and we do think that it can go head to head with, um, you know, virtually everybody in star. I mean, there's a few maybe examples, you know, but, um, you know, we we're, we're happy every day to try to come up with a compelling redemption proposition so that the product can then speak for itself and to, um, you know, introduce as many people as possible to our long haul services. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say, I mean, I, I flew you guys back from London, Foz and I did. Uh, and I got to, I had one, I had, to, I had to change the flight at the last minute. We did it at the airport uh, and they did it for free, which I was amazed by. And, uh, 
uh, it, I, it was a great product. I really enjoyed it back to Vancouver. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. Um, one last question I have for you guys uh, before we, we, we uh, take a break and, and have our bonus topic. Uh, what kind of exciting trips did you take pre-COVID? Since I'm, I'm assuming you didn't take any during COVID that are, you know, overseas exciting. And then what, tr- what trips are you planning on taking after COVID? Scott, I'll, I'll direct that to you because we all know we we all know you have the craziest uh, flight memory. <laughs> Pro- probably, um, uh, hey boy, there there are just so many runs to to pick from. Uh, maybe two I'll point out. One was probably just uh, maybe a month uh, before uh, you know, before COVID started locking us all down. Um, you know, there was a weekend run to London, uh, which in and of itself isn't, uh, you know, isn't that big of a deal, but the fact that we did it by a Doha and musket, uh, kind of made it special. <laughs> uh, we were, we, we were still home in time for, uh, for dinner on, on Sunday night, uh, which is great. Um, Actually, Spencer, you're, you're forgetting your mission was to go home. My wife and baby son were in London and I had promised to have lunch with them. Um, and so we were trying to solve for two things in one go. But sorry, Scott, please. Uh, nope. That was a good off by two, right? Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, oh yeah, it was a great one. Just <clears throat> uh, the other one I point out, uh, we did a around the world. And this was like over maybe a three or four day weekend. Uh, but uh, the focal point um, uh, was uh, Lukla in Nepal. Uh, so we got oh. to do uh, that that fantastic, you know, airport carved in the side of uh, basically the the base of of Mount Everest. Uh, that is probably that's still I think to this day is one of the most interesting uh, interesting landings that we've ever done. Because, you know, what, what we really try to balance on these is, you know, uh, a combination of premium experiences, new airports, you know, uh, you know, new destinations, you know, dots, lines and destinations. And in many cases, uh, new aircraft uh, as well. So, yeah, that, that one definitely. <laughs> you're you're our new tagline. Thank you for that. that was <laughs> I got to say, I, I, I don't know how long ago you did that. Look, now you can't fly there from Kathmandu anymore. They moved it out to like another airport further away, which makes it much harder. So oh. I didn't get to do it. I didn't actually, I missed that when we were there last December or November. So I'm jealous. Yeah, you're even back then, though, uh, yeah. you know, you were lucky if flights were operating that day. And oh, sure. We almost found ourselves stranded because the crowds rolled in. The clouds rolled in after we had landed. And so what was intended to be called a, a 90 minute turn. Uh, yeah. I don't mind that you didn't brief me on the likelihood of, you know, fatality. <laughs> what I mind is that you didn't brief me on the likelihood that we would be stuck there for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> we're stuck there for a long, long time. You know, you know, we have on this show, we have a little bit of a history of getting stuck places. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say a little bit of a history of fatality. But no. <laughs> I do have another uh, friend that was stuck in Lukla for, I think, four days. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so Scott answered the kind of before, I'll answer the during COVID. I actually have traveled during COVID quite a bit, including internationally. Um, just to be very clear, I mean, you know, I wasn't traveling for March you know, April, May, but there was a point in time at which the science became clear enough. And you actually had, uh, unfortunately, very few, but some jurisdictions that actually cared to put proper thought and scientific reasoning and um, economic imperatives all together to design travel programs that were safe and effective. And I really just want to take out a moment and call out Greece, um, who did an amazing job uh, getting their tourism industry to safely operate over the summer and keep their own numbers low, despite the fact that I think they had about 60% of the traffic they usually have. And it's obviously a huge destination. So that that's not small at all. Um, and I had the opportunity to uh, go to Greece with a transit in Germany. And I specifically wanted to fly on our partner Lufthansa to see kind of how they were adapting to COVID and, and on our partner United. Um, and I did that. Um, and it was a phenomenal trip. The, 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 the worst part of my, my experience was the connection in Chicago. And it wasn't at all United. United, United did a great job, but um, it was it was other things there. And even there, it wasn't that bad. It was just, you know, relatively speaking. Um, so it was a great trip all around. Um, and, you know, I've done a bunch of domestic travel. The problem in Canada is we have a blanket 14 day quarantine, which has no basis whatsoever in science. Um, and that quarantine is now being replaced with um, a, a smarter program, at least in, in Calgary of uh, testing on arrival. And quite frankly, it's obviously a lot better to test everybody so you know than a blanket 14-day quarantine you don't know, right? Um, and so I'm really hopeful. It's it's a very, very smart program. I'm really hopeful that um, it will um, be expanded across the country and that will allow for um, you know more uh, travel. But of course, done reasonably and safely, right? Travel, but travel, you know, follow the protocols, wear your mask, 
hand hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. Everything we know, don't travel irresponsibly, travel responsibly. Um, well, gentlemen, I think that's the, the regular show. We're going to have a, a bonus topic for our Patreon listeners here in a second. Uh, but again, thank you for, for coming on and discussing the new Aeroplan program with us, uh, Scott O'Leary and Mark Nasser. Uh, thanks again. And uh, to our listeners, they can follow you, Air Canada, on Twitter, or is there somewhere else they should look? <laughs> Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, yeah. yeah. So many ways to follow us. You'll, you'll find us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And to our listeners, you can follow us on Twitter at dots lines, uh, more dots, more uh, Until the next episode, uh, happy travels. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.